Bangladesh, we learn from our team. Um, Aslam uh, good evening all, uh, welcome to this week's City Circle. Um, the, the theme that we're going to be discussing this evening is, um, is both topical and quite depressing, but also one that we really need to start kind of focusing our minds on. It's around the, uh, the number of Muslims that end up in prison and also the, the level of reoffending rates of Muslims going back into prison. Uh, the stats are pretty alarming. Um, since 1997, the, the Muslim population prison has gone from just over 3,500 to over 11,000 in 2012. So that's 6% to 13% of, of people in prison are Muslims. And that percentage on its own is extremely alarming and disturbing. Um, given that Muslims are 5% of the UK population. When we start looking at the number of the portion of Muslims among the young offenders, so young people kind of between the age of 18 to 20, that percentage goes up to over 20%, so one in five. So that's, this is kind of really um, kind of shocking kind of stats out there. So I think there's a couple of questions that we need to kind of really understand and ask uh, this evening to kind of understand why, why we are in this position and what we need to do about it. So I think the questions that we need to kind of ask are, why are so many Muslims going to prison to begin with? You know, why are an increasing proportion of younger offenders made up of Muslims? Um, what happens in these prisons that leads to this kind of reoffending rate? Um, and, why are, yeah, and why are younger Muslims more likely to reoffend among those reoffending population? And then I think once we can understand those and answer, have some answers to those questions, can we um, can attempt to try and kind of break this cycle of reoffending? So in order to help answer these questions, we have a very qualified and experienced panel with us this evening. Um, starting on my extreme left, we have Imam Shafi Qadim, who is the Muslim chaplain at the Rochester Young Offenders Institute. Uh, he's previously the coordinating chaplain over there. He's been at Rochester for almost a decade and has a wealth of experience in dealing with reducing reoffending for most uh, Muslim and non-Muslim communities. He also runs a niche consultancy firm which focuses on delivering um, best way community consultancy services across all sectors and able organisations to engage with, with Muslims and Muslim communities over dealing with these issues. Um, to his right is uh, Tayyip Osmani, who you might remember, he was our guest at the uh, Street Circle Eve social event we held in August last year. So we're really pleased to have Tayyip back. Tayyip's the CEO of Henley Homes, which is an award winning property development company in London. He's also a vice board member of the LGR Fund, which is a Luxembourg-based specialist hotel property fund. Um, in addition, he's a trustee of the West London Islamic Centre and also chairman and founder of the Better Community Business Network. And Ty has a kind of personal passion in terms of dealing with this particular issue. He's also been involved in mentoring young Muslims who come out of prison. And then finally, uh, last but not least, on my left, is Ahmed Abi, who's the head of the Zakat Distribution um, the Department of the National Zakat Foundation, which is the UK's leading institution for the local collection and disbursement of zakat. And the National Zakat Foundation is launching, and is doing uh, uh, a number of projects in this area, and also kind of launching a particular project that we'll kind of discuss later this evening in terms of how we can practically get involved in dealing with, with this issue. So on that note, if we kick off with Imam Shafiq, that's hands right up to you.
processes and, uh, and uh, projects and programs around this so that we're capable of, of, of uh, dealing with this problem internally. Um, that's not to say we couldn't go to external help, but it's really important for us to, to take a stand on this for ourselves as well and, and show some uh, maturity in terms of what we're going to deliver for, for this particular group. Um, everyone that I know um, <coughs> has been affected by crime in some shape or form. That's either directly, indirectly, that's through family members, knowing someone's been to prison. Um, this is an issue which, if, if you ask anyone in the room, I'm sure that they will know someone who has been to prison or have experienced prison themselves, or family members have experienced prison. Um, what I would say, that in the, in the last 10 years at Rochester, um, I've come across a whole bunch of different situations, scenarios, people, and, and I've asked a lot of questions of myself as well. And I'll, I'll run you through some of the questions that I've asked myself over a period of time, you may have similar sorts of questions. Um, how much help should be given to, to Muslim offenders and what's the most appropriate help? That's something I've asked myself over and over again. What's our collective responsibility towards this group? Um, and what's the limit to that? Who is responsible for crime, the individual or the society? And how much emphasis should or, or weight should be on each of those, those group's shoulders? If we don't help offenders stop committing crime, what's the effect on all of us? So what's the collective effect? What, what, what do we suffer from that as a community? Should the better off in society help those who are in a worse off position? And leading on from that, when is a crime a mistake? And how many mistakes are we allowed to make? How many mistakes uh, have we made as us, as individuals? And how would we feel if someone we knew, or someone who was close to us, had ended up in prison? So would that change our perspective on this particular topic? I've developed ideas and sort of thought processes and positions on each of these um, questions over a period of time based on the experiences that I've had um, and the people that I've met. Um, and I, I feel that they're probably quite grounded, but they're not set in stone, so they change over a period of time when different things happen. But I've got some good answers for those. And these are the sorts of questions that when we go out and do talks, we get questioned about. People say this stuff to us. Why would we help these guys that commit crime? Why would we help a person who's committed crime? What should we do about this guy? He took it on his own shoulders. It was his problem. This happened, that happened. Da, da, da. So we have to have some sort of understanding around this, uh, this area. Um, but also I've asked myself about what drives people towards crime. And I've experienced a lot of... Uh, difficult situations for, for the people that are in my prison. So, if I'll give you a small example, um, it's quite graphic, So, but I, I feel it's relevant, so I'm, I'm going to say it anyway. There was a young man who we had in our custody who was, um, he obviously had some kind of emotional issues and mental health issues. He would expose himself to anyone in the prison, uh, whether that be male, female, um, and he would get uh, sexually excited by fighting people. So he would fight officers and so forth just to get this kind of uh, excitement from him. Um, and a lot of people, when they met him, they said, you know, the guy's such a mess, you know, what a messed up guy, what a terrible guy, and he's a problem, he's a, he's a real issue in our society. But if you look at his history, and I'll run you through a, sh a short potted history. Uh, when he was young, his mother sexually abused him, and his mother and father had split up. Um, she got arrested for that sexual abuse and went to prison. So he was then taken to his father. His father also sexually abused him. Um, his story, I mean, this is a Muslim we're talking about as well, by the way. Um, his father then was sent to prison for a long period of time. While his father was in prison, his mother committed suicide while she was in prison. Uh, his father then uh, had another case put on him while he was in prison, and he ended up uh, having a life sentence. He was then taken from there and put into foster care. The foster carers, uh, they sexually abused him. Then... He moved from that foster carers to another foster carers, and they also sexually abused him. Then he ran away from that foster carers, as they offered him a third family to go to. He ran away, and this was at the age of 12. Uh, he ran away, uh, he lived on the streets of London, and uh, over a period of time, obviously, he developed certain things that he had to do to survive, uh, and became a rent boy as, as part of that. So it's no huge surprise that you ended up in my prison. You know, you have to ask yourself what, what, what would we have done in that scenario. 
So there's a personal responsibility there. You know, you, you have to take responsibility for yourself. But the questions have to be asked about where that responsibility lies and who, you know, who, who has an input to that. You know, what, 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 what position are we in there? Some, some of the things that we see with people in prison are often repeated patterns. So there's, some, some, there's, there's quite an array of different things that make people commit crime. But they're oft repeated patterns and groups of people who go through the same types of scenarios. And you, know, you can categorise them into maybe a handful of things which pretty much everyone in the prison has been affected by. Um, some of them are really simple and basic and some of them are a bit more surprising. That makes for... Uh, kind of interesting debate as to whether these things really have that effect or not, but that's my experience of things. Some of the things that really uh, do drive uh, crime are peer group, lack of aspiration, lack of skills, lack, lack of education, mental health issues, suitable accommodation, greed, gang issues, substance misuse issues, mental health issues, family issues, mental, physical, sexual abuse, finance issues. These are all really basic things that a lot or the vast majority of people within our custody uh, face. I'll throw a few facts at you before I finish, um, just to tell you sort of what, what sort of position we're in and whether this is an important issue or not. Um, you, can, you can judge for yourself. Uh, per capita, UK, we're, I think, one, two, three, four, we're the fifth, in, in, fifth, fifth highest prison population per capita in the world. So that in itself is a big concern. The various pieces of research have shown that when the difference between the top end of society and the bottom end of society is large, the larger the difference, the more people in prison. That's an interesting fact. Uh, Muslims in prison, we've already stated, uh, around about 13% currently and 5% in the community, roughly. That's a bit of a problem. Um, agreed, some people become Muslim in prison, you know, there's conversion, some people find their faith in prison and so forth. And agreed, a lot of crime gets committed in the cities where the majority of the Muslims live. But that doesn't detract from the fact that we still have 13% of Muslims in prison. Um, the rate of increase of Muslim prisoners in British prisons is much, much faster than the indigenous population. Um, as was mentioned before, we're 13% now, and we were 6% in 1997. And this figure is still increasing. Uh, it's increasing exponentially. Um, it's not even petering off. Um, that's a real concern. A, a lot of the minority groups that came to the UK, they had spikes in their um, prison populations when they first came here. And that's been true of us, as Muslim communities who have been here maybe 80, 50, 30, 40 years. Um, the issue with us guys, unfortunately, as Muslims, is that uh, proportions of our community have not driven themselves out of that slump. So there are, there are groups of our societies which have managed to do well and, and move on, and there are large groups of our societies which haven't and aren't, and are still going down and down and down. Muslim young offenders, 17 to 21, represent a quarter of the prison population in some prisons. That's a large percentage, um, and that's even more worrying as you know we consider our youth to be our future. So that that's a worrying statistic. Um, ages of people in prison, Muslims in prison, 12 to 70, 12 to 80. There's there's 12 year old Muslims in prison, there's 80 year old Muslims in prison, and everything in between. Muslim countries represented in the UK prisons, not exhaustive, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Algeria, Morocco, Nigeria, Gambia, Egypt, Tunisia, UAE, Saudi, Turkey, Iran, whichever country you want to name, we've got people from those countries in our prisons. And so if you think about the ethnicities that come with that, the, uh, uh, you know, the, the races that come with that, we've got pretty much all types of Muslims in prison. Um, Currently, most of the Muslims in my particular prison, they are uh, based around London. So that's the large proportion of, of the people and the surrounding areas that they, that in, my, in my prison that are Muslim, they are based around London. Crimes committed by Muslims in my prison, in all prisons, but certainly in my prison, murder, rape, um, paedophilia, terrorist, terrorist act, people are in there for terrorist act, 
uh, ABH, GBH, false instrument, burglary, handling stolen goods, drugs related offences, robbery, you name it, there isn't a crime that Muslims who are in my prison have not committed. So it's not that we've got a particular issue like a drug problem or a, we've got a wide ranging, uh, wide ranging issues for, for Muslims being in prison. And uh, the last fact I'll throw at you is that um, crime is now becoming a second or third generation problem. So this is not um, first generation came, worked hard, didn't look after the youngsters, they went off the rails a bit, difficult to match into society, not quite knowing what your identity is, did a bit of crime. No, it's not, it's not that now. Now we've got people who, whose fathers and grandfathers were in a trade, if you want to call it, and which was handed down to them. And now you've got people who, whose fathers took them out, you know, doing burglaries because they were small and they could fit through the window. Okay, and now that child takes his own child out doing burglaries. Uh, I, I went on a wing the other day and I was listening to a guy on the phone, on the pin phone, and he was talking to someone who was laughing, really laughing out loud. And uh, when he finished, I said to him, "Why are you laughing?" And he said, "Oh, my dad said to me, it's really funny, son. Like you're in the same cell that I was in 20 years ago." <laughs> this is a generational problem, and that cycle. That cycle needs to be broken in some shape or form. Now, in terms of Muslims coming back to prison, um, I get lots and lots and lots of people coming back to my prison. Um, I often hear stories of people who have left my prison and been shot dead or they've uh, died or something's happened to them. Uh, other times I, I never hear of them, I never see them. That's kind of depressing from my side. You know, when you've done some good work and someone doesn't come back, you don't see them. But the work that you haven't done so great, maybe, or someone hasn't been affected by it, they're the guys that come back to prison. And that statistic is, is, is pretty large. Sometimes they come back because they've broken license conditions, like, for example, got into an area that they shouldn't have gone into. Other times it's because they've committed crime or committed more crime. Um, I've had people in my prison that have been in prison six times at the age of 19. I've had other people who... They've been in and, in and out, and they're, they're at the age of 50 or 60 now. They've already been in and out of prison all of their life. In my prison, we have 650 offenders, 120 are registered as Muslim. That's nearly 20%. Some have lifetime licenses upon release. Uh, for those of you who don't know the IPP system, you have a lifetime um, license, 99 years, and then you serve a tariff of whatever it be, 20 years, 10 years. Um, I've got a guy who's in my prison right now, a Muslim fellow who was 15 when he received a 24-year tariff on, on his uh, license. So he's done about five years now, he's got another 20 to do. Um, and then he'll be on license for the rest of his life. Now that's a significant problem, because he's got another 20 years to do before he can apply for parole. If he doesn't get the parole, he spends another two years, five years or whatever it is till the next parole, and that goes on until 99 years. Now if he does manage to get out, he's on license for the rest of his life. It's a significant problem for us. Um, why do people come back? Well, the, the things that I mentioned before are really key. Accommodation. If someone doesn't have suitable accommodation, they come back very rapidly. It doesn't matter what they've planned, what they've got, who they've got out there. They will rob someone to uh, stay in a hotel for the night <coughs> on a park bench or get robbed or abused for, them, for yourself. So a lot of people will come back the, the night that they go out. If they don't have accommodation, they'll come straight back. That's a key thing. Um, and they've got issues when people come out, right? So you've got this issue of jobs are hard enough to find, but if you've got a criminal record and you're turning up for a job, uh, you've got no chance. And so the cycle continues. What I've noticed, though, for the people that don't come back, so we talk about people that are coming back and why they're coming back. For the people that don't come back, often the people that don't come back are people that have had some very shocking news in prison. One of my worst jobs that I have to do is, um, after I've checked things, is to tell someone uh, some terrible news. So, for example, to go and see an offender somewhere and tell him, sorry to tell you, your dad was found, uh, you know, hanging, dead inside his house. Uh, your mother committed suicide. Your brother overdosed. Your sister was shot dead. Whatever it be. And guys who come into prisons often lead quite hectic lives and the families are surrounded by they are surrounded by also the detective life. So when you tell someone the news like that, it often breaks the bubble. And that is the guy that doesn't often come back to prison. Um, so it tells you that there's, there's something that's needed to change a mentality of a person who wants to change their life. It doesn't happen overnight unless there's a real big shock in their system. Um, we, 
we in prisons, we're not really there to change people's mentality. That's a very difficult thing to do. I can work all day and do courses and groups and what have you with a person. Um, I can teach them to be punctual and uh, decisive. and uh, you know, I can teach them all of these things, but they're going to still be a criminal on the outside. I've just made a more efficient criminal. I have to work a way of, of, of inducing a change within someone's mind. It's a very difficult thing to do. So we often don't work towards this. We haven't got the resources for it. We wait until people come who have made a decision to change and then we enable that change if we can. That's kind of the best we can do. So reducing this uh, reoffending cycle has, has many different aspects to it. I've talked about some of them. Um, the real solution I found is is a mixture of both practical and spiritual things. So although we can give someone, you know, teach someone how to pray, and we can teach them the fiqh of their religion, and we can teach them the essence of the deen, the tarbiyah, um, you know, we without some practical aspects, that's useless. It's absolutely useless. If a person hasn't got work, they will soon go back to their old ways. If a person doesn't change their peer group, it, it's a total waste of time. And at the same time, we can't just pr produce a house and a job and say, here you go, off you go. They also, you need a mixture of, of, of both of those things to, uh, in my opinion, to, to uh, induce a change and, and to, to make a sustainable change for someone. Um, realistically, we can't undo a lifetime of problems in a few months or even years within the prison environment. Um, but there are elements of support that we can deliver which have a huge impact and can have long-lasting effects. And these effects on these young people have a ripple effect, i.e. when you fix one person or if one person fixes themselves or you help them to be fixed, then they go on and have better family relationships, better children and so forth. And it's a ripple of goodness. If you don't fix a person in prison or if they don't fix, then there's a ripple of badness that comes out of that. Um, I'd like to pass you over to Tarek, inshallah, just uh, to fill you in on some of the work that he's been doing with, the practical work he's been doing with some of the uh, offenders and ex-offenders. Thank you. Um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good evening. Um, my experiences are, are nowhere near as broad as Shafiqi experiences uh, these sorts of things all day long. And I've never worked with anyone sort of on, uh, had to be um, sort of convicted of sexual offences or anything like that. I wouldn't really know how to deal with it. The majority of people that I have worked with over probably, probably a period of uh, 10 years, and I counted it out the other day, it's about. Uh, 23, it's all been to do with crime, gangs, that, that type of stuff. And you would, you would think that everybody that goes to prison comes from a bad family. It's, 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 that's not really the case. I mean, I've worked with plenty of people that don't come from bad families, they come from very, very good families. And I suppose over the last 10 years or so, I've, I've come to sort of understand that our community and, and why um, people sort of keep going back to prison, our community's got a very, very kind of unique and clever way of dealing with its social problems. And that is that they just don't accept they have it. So if they don't accept they have it, they just never need to deal with it. And there's a lot of shame and embarrassment attached with uh, sort of young people that, that uh, end up in prison. So no one talks about it, no one wants to fix it, and, and it just continues on and on. So they end up in a situation whereby they come out of prison, they're good people that they may wish to mix with, won't mix with them because obviously they know of their, um, their past record. Um, and sooner or later, they're just driven back to the people that they used to hang around with before, because that's the only part of the community that really understands them. And so the, the, the cycle sort of um, continues. And if you speak to sort of organisations like uh, sort of Muslim Youth Helpline, they will tell you how the community deals with these sorts of um, social problems. Then we go on to sort of other places like mosques and what what sort of um, uh, role does the mosque play in sort of managing its youth and, and, and trying to focus. The, the minds of the youth on something which is positive as opposed to the, the sort of stuff that they um, kind of get involved in. And that's com a complete dead end. You know, most mosques have got no idea, they don't recognize the issue, they wouldn't know how to deal with it. And they think that someone who's doing youth work is someone who's young and is talking to the youngsters, and they think that's what is involved in youth work. And it obviously is completely wrong. Um, and then you, you kind of you, you hear it that, you know, if the parents should have brought up their children better, and that's true. Maybe the parents could have brought up their children better, but I would say that the parents' responsibility in the bringing up of the child is probably no more than about 30%. Because as they get older, they get to about 13 or 14 years old, the, the peer pressure, just everything that's around them, is, is far, far more attractive. And if you have that within you, if you have that kind of rebellious nature and you're trying to break free of, of the constraints of the family you've been brought up in and you've been forced to go to the mosque when you really never wanted to go to the mosque, 
because the mosque was such an oppressive environment, certainly that's what it was like when, when I was growing up. Um, as soon as you can break free out of that, and you, you can sort of exercise that rebellion, then that's what you do. So I, I would lay less blame at the, at the parents' door. Um, I don't think the parents have got nowhere near as much control as, as people think that they have got. And, you know, when we try to sort of address this issue about um, Muslims in prison, I mean, people in prison is just a terrible thing anyway, but obviously I relate it to the community I best understand, and that's the Muslim community. And when you try to talk about that, it's, it's exactly as it should be said, that you're in a situation whereby people say, well, you know, he broke the law, so therefore what's it got to do with us? You know, let him go to prison, and if he wants to go back to prison because he breaks the law again, then that should continue. I mean, it's nothing to do with us. But, you know, I've always said to people that, you know, a Muslim burglar, he doesn't discriminate. He may just come and burgle your house, but the more there are, the, the more burglaries that will, that will take place. And the chance are they're going to do it in the area that they live in, because that's the area that they understand. But, you know, um, there is this kind of very um, kind of um, closed view about people going to prison. And I say to them that, you know, when you have someone in your family that's gone to prison, you'll understand what that's all about. It's not just about the young person that's gone to prison or the person that's gone to prison. It's about the entire family, what it does to the entire family. And, uh, you know, what, as far as sort of personal reputations and dignity is concerned, you know, um, people that have got very, very sort of uh, self-respecting parents have now got to sort of um, bow their heads as they walk through the streets. And that's, that's very, very true. That's not an exaggeration. So I think that, you know, from, from my perspective, I think that we, we as a community should deal with our own problems. You know, we can rely on the government and the state and, and ask them that, you know, you should have this program, that program. But until we accept what the problem is, I don't think we're ever going to be able to deal with it. And even when we had this, when we set off down this road, and I've known him be probably for about two years, and we've talked about this project uh, for two years, and, and I've said to him that, look, you know, I've been working with um, and mentoring young Muslims that are either in prison or coming out of prison um, for about 10 years or so, and I would say that out of the 23, there's not a single one that's ever gone back to prison. But that's because that's very, very kind of intensive mentoring. It's not just about, you know, um, uh, sort of meeting up with them once a month and then having a cup of tea and then telling them that everything's going to be okay and carry on trying looking for a job. It's, it's about finding a job for them. It's simple things like helping them fill in their driving license application because if they continue to drive without a license, they're going to, they're going to end up getting stopped by the police and then they get, um, then they're recognised again and then, and then the whole sort of cycle continues. And some of these people, and they're quite, some of them are quite young, 18, 19, 20, and they can't, fill in a, they can't actually fill in a license application. They actually don't know what to do. And they want to do it, but they don't actually know what to do, even so much so that you've got to kind of pay for it, because if you don't pay for it, they're not going to get it. But once they get it, and they've done their theory, you know, they're kind of like over the moon, because it's an achievement in their life. The fact that they've got a driving license, which is now one step closer to them to be, um, being able to drive. So a lot of these people are very, very naive. They don't really necessarily, from, from my, certainly from my experience, have the social skills to deal with some of a lot of the issues uh, now that they've never been um, sort of taught it. And my, my view has always been that, you know, you have to take control of your own community and, do, and, and, and try to deal with your own community first, rather than um, sort of thinking that it's, it's somebody else's problem. And, you know, um, I've also found that, you know, the perception of, of people in prison is, is certainly the ones that I've worked with, is that the prisons are prison is full of really, really terrible bad people. It's not. It's, it's, it's full of a lot of very, very good people that have done some very, very terrible things. And some of those terrible things have been done because of their circumstances and because of what kind of support systems they've got around them. It's done out of desperation. No one actually really wants to go to prison. Um, and when you get into that kind of desperate state and you've got no opportunity, you've got no education, you've got no way of getting a job, you've already been in prison two or three times, you can't give anyone a CV that you can't tell them what you've been doing for the last three or four years. You're not going to get a job because no one's going to uh, willfully employ um, someone that um, you know, sort of commits crime for, for a living. So I think that um, these are the sorts of issues uh, that we're dealing with and we're kind of, because as a community and probably as a wider community, we're forcing them back into that kind of position because there's no other way of them sort of earning money. Um, when I started off down this road, um, sort of about 10 years ago, I, I had friends of mine that, that are lawyers and they're bringing me up and say, look, you know, would you mind um, speaking to this particular family um, because they're very, very distraught, they can't, um, they can't deal with their son or he's in prison or whatever. And I would always say to them that, look, here's my number, ask them to give me a call because I know that if a parent is going to call me, someone they've never met before, they've got to be absolutely desperate. That means that they don't have anyone within their own circle that they can talk to. Maybe they don't want to talk to anyone in, in, in their own circle, but whatever it is, they've got to be very, completely desperate. 
And sometimes they'll spend two, two and a half hours on the phone starting with, you know, what they were like when they were young and how this happened and how that happened and how they blame themselves and so on and so forth. And I've heard it so many times that you just know what, what the pattern is, is, is really going to be. Um, and you set off down this road of, of, of trying to help people. And a lot of it is just trying to understand exactly what's going on in their head and what, what are, the, what are the, 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 the buttons that you need to push which then starts making them think about it. And, you know, I'll say to people that are sitting in prison, that look around the prison and you go on and speak to the 50-year-old Joe in prison and ask them what has happened over the, over the last sort of 30 years of their, or 40 years or so when they've been coming backwards and forwards. And that's where you will be unless you decide to make some changes. And those changes aren't going to be easy and it's going to take a lot of time. And you have to cut yourself off from everything and everybody that you know because those are the people, and I'm not saying they're bad people, but they're just bad for you. And you have to create that separation. You have to cut that um, umbilical cord. Do you know what an umbilical cord is? No, then I have to explain to them what it is. Because some of them don't actually know. Um, and it's very, very hard. It's extremely hard for them because they have a, they have a culture, they have a lifestyle, and to just um, sort of step away from that and go and sit in the corner, it's not easy to do. And they can't go and sit, they can't, they can't go and sit with that part of the community that is considered to be respectful or respected because they don't want anything to do with them. So it does become very difficult. The, most, um, the key aspect of all of this is to find them a job. If you can get them a job and they can get some kind of um, money coming in, then there's less chances of them sort of uh, reoffending. So the way that we've always focused it is that we find them a job. A lot of these guys have, have worked with us. Um, and I've got one guy that's working with us at the moment um, who's from Slough. All we've had to do is just take him out of that, that whole Slough environment, that whole kind of gang culture where... You know, his mother would ring me up at 11.30 at night and say that um, I found the gun, but it's gone again. And it's 11.30, there's police up and down the road, and he's not answering my call. Then I'd ring him up, and I'd say to him, you know, Fouad, where are you? He said, well, I'm just on my way back. I said, whatever you've got on your bag, you need to leave it somewhere because there's police on your road. So it's that kind of conversation. And these conversations can take place at 11.30 in the, uh, um, at night. It can take place at 4 o'clock in the morning because they now need someone to arrange a permanent solicitor. Do you know someone? And, you know, and it's generally the parents that will call. And they're, they're completely, completely distraught because they can't connect. There's no connection between them, uh, between um, uh, the, the, the parents and, and the, the young man that's uh, committing these sorts of offences. So um, when I came across Shafiq, and I suppose we've been working together for a couple of years to try and find a solution to this. And then, you know, I knew uh, the National Siddharth Foundation, I knew Iqbal, and I presented it to him because I know they've done some work sort of with Women's Refuge, and they had the various pieces that we felt were needed, you know, some money that were providing the housing element. Um, Shafi, I suppose, is providing the raw materials. He can assess who in prison is ready for the kind of program that we're putting forward. And people like us that come from the, uh, the, the business kind of background, and we've got, you know, huge numbers of people that are friends of ours, that would, um, that would want to get involved in a project like this. And I've always said to people, friends of mine that have employed people that come out of prison, I've said to them that, you know, when you get somebody that wants to change their life around, they are going to be the most punctual, the most reliable person, because they know what it is not to have that job and what it is then to go back to that life from before. So my view is, and, and, and certainly my experience has been, that anyone that really wants to change their life, they're not going backwards, you know, as long as we don't force them to go backwards. And I think sometimes that responsibility um, sort of very much falls with the community. We've got um, our big sort of business uh, networking fundraising event on February the 24th. I'd ask um, everyone to support it that can. Uh, Nick Clegg is our guest speaker. They you know, we've sat with in government circles at the highest levels of government and said to them, this is the issue, this, this is how we're actually dealing with it. But we can tell you we don't require any money from you. We're just letting you know what it is that we're doing and how we're doing it. We're funding all of this ourselves. So, I mean, that's, that's pretty much the right thing. <coughs> spoken about the issues in the community in regards to um, ex, ex offenders in the community and the, the, the problems they're facing inside, the problems they're facing once they come outside. Um, those of uh, you haven't heard of the National Zakat Foundation, just a kind of uh, a quick kind of introduction. Uh, the National Zakat Foundation was set up a couple of years ago to kind of respond to the issues uh, in the community. Um, and what we've done is essentially it's been collecting zakat in the UK for distribution of zakat in the UK. And over the last couple of years, we've come across uh, a whole array of issues that we've had to deal with. 
Um, recently, I did the statistics to, to the number of cases that we've done dealt with. Um, over 30 months, we've processed about 1,000 applications, distributed about over a million pounds now. And 41% of the cases that we've kind of processed are homelessness related. And of those clear cases, most of these cases are related to uh, domestic violence, um, ex-offenders, people are falling to debt and they've become homeless. Um, and so those are the typical cases that we deal with. Now, what the National Zakat Foundation has been doing over the last couple of years, once we've kind of uh, been collecting the data and understanding what the issues are, we've been trying to look for solutions. Solutions that's going to give a, a kind of sustainable, independent kind of, uh, living for an individual. So it's not a handout so that, you know, here you go, £30, that's your week's food and you should be okay from next week on, because that's not the case. Because next week on, they're going to need that £30 again, because this, the root cause of the problem hasn't been dealt with. And, and that's what we're trying to do. So in this, this project here, where we're dealing with um, uh, trying to you know, find a solution for ex-offenders going through this uh, vicious cycle of coming out of prison and going into prison, um, we've come with this, uh, with this project. And, I'd just like to kind of pause for a second and say that this project would not have been possible without the, uh, the openness of uh, both Shafiq and Tariq. It, it re really is, uh, we've been here for 60, 70 years in, in the UK, and a project of this nature has not been delivered. And we're only able to deliver a project of this nature because of the contributions of the two individuals at this table here today. Um, so, um, may Allah make, uh, you know, make it easy for them and uh, give them abundant reward. Um, I'll just give you an example. I know we've talk, spoken about uh, some of the issues uh, the ex offenders face, uh, but if, if an ex offender is coming out of prison and he's got no family, no friends, no relatives to return to, and for argument's sake, they, they're only given a small amount of money. So let's say for argument's sake, they're given £100, and they don't get £100. They're given £100, for example. When they come out of prison, they're homeless. So the first thing that's on their mind is shelter. Now, where do you find shelter that's going to sustain you for an X amount or enough, a long enough period where you can get a job with £100? So if you go and put yourself in the most cheapest uh, hostel in, in London, for example, it could range between £8 to £16 to £30 to £60 a night. A night. And then he has to deal with his kind of hunger issues. He has to deal with the fact that, you know, you know, the government has, st has stipulated that £30 is sufficient enough money for an individual to kind of survive on, on a weekly basis for food. Now, you, you just do the basic maths here. That £100 is going to run out in a matter of days. So in a matter of days, this individual is going to be homeless, he's going to be starving. And what does he end up doing? He's going to end up trying to kind of feed himself. So if he goes to the masjid, and the masjid doesn't deal with him or doesn't support him, he's going to go to a shop where he can get food. And he hasn't got the money for the food, so what does he do? He's going to steal the food. He gets caught and gets thrown into prison. A couple of weeks ago, I, re I recently read an article where an individual, a lady, was forced to um, uh, give birth to a child in prison. Uh, it was a miscarriage. And she was uh, forced to stay with, with, the, unborn, with the, the born child that was dead for, for two days at a row. And she had to clean up her own mess. And the reason why she was in prison in the first place is because her benefits were cut. And because her benefits were cut, she ended up stealing from a shop. And when she stole from a shop in court, and she's in prison. And we're getting benefits cut all over the place. A couple of days ago, I read, read another article where an individual who's disabled, who was told that his, uh, his disability now <laughs> uh, would be cut, he just couldn't take it. Because over the Christmas period, he couldn't celebrate Christmas, he didn't have enough money to and we even feed himself or get gifts. He just took his own life. And this is just not an exceptional case. It happens all <coughs> the time. And it's become increasingly common. Um, so what, 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 what's the project that the National Zakat Foundation is doing? So the project is that we're commissioning St. Mungus, one of the largest homelessness charities in the UK, to deliver a project for ex-offenders. The, the project itself is going to have three kind of roles. is to provide employment, support and um, and housing. So the, as soon as they come out, they will refer to uh, this project. They will, the housing is housing need is provided for. BCBN would, through its business network, will try to get employment for him. 
And if not, the support that he gets in, in, the, in the housing uh, project will be able to kind of enhance the CV, enhance the skills, and be able to go and get a job out there. Um, this is the, so this is a step-by-step -step process. Now, we uh, have a couple of projects with other sh um, shelter projects. So, for example, we've got one for Muslim women in South London, uh, in partnership with St. Mungus. It's a 14-bed uh, project where uh, homeless uh, women are able to kind of stay in a Muslim environment and have their needs attended to. And we've got another project in Birmingham, uh, again delivered by Trident, to attend to the needs of, needs of Muslim women. And we've got, soon, in the, in the next couple of months, we will have another project opening up in Manchester, again, attending to the needs of Muslim women. And why the Muslim women? I don't want to go too much into detail, but again, this is an increasing problem that Muslim women are being, uh, are being forced to live under horrendous conditions due to domestic violence or because they've been trafficked into this country and forced into prostitution and they don't know their language and they end up living in those conditions and they've never had a way out. And even if they had a way out, they'll go to another shelter or a hostel where it's not a friendly environment, where they actually become forced into kind of criminality or forced into prostitution because there is no other way to kind of survive on the streets anymore. Um, so this, this project um, would be delivered or uh, well, started in the next couple of months. The employment, uh, the vacancies have gone out. And inshallah, we will be uh, recruiting uh, staff and giving them training and uh, you know, we'd be kind of starting the process where these uh, star new staff members would be going into prison. We're going to start a process where they're befriending uh, the prison, uh, prisoners that will be soon coming out, so that they've kind of got a process where there's a step-by-step step, step step process taking place, where they're walking into familiar territory, not into unknown territory, and there's a continuity of the services that Imam um, Shafiq provides in prison, the Islamic spiritual cultural needs, so that when they come out, they're attended to in this project. So this project is a eight bed facility with prayer facilities, uh, a, a local mosque is nearby, colleges nearby, transport links are very good. And uh, we hope to kind of expand these projects. Now, I want to quickly wrap up, but we, we need to, as a community, deal with this, uh, the, the problems that we are facing. We've been here for 60, 70 years and we've been talking about issues, but never coming out with solutions. And this is what the National Zakat Foundation is trying to do, is trying to find solutions. So in 30 years' time, we don't want to be here talking about the ex-offenders problem. We don't want to be talking about women facing domestic violence. We don't want to be talking about crippling debt. We don't want to talk about you know, individuals who are starving in their house. So we want to be finding solutions. And so we, I'm not here fundraising, um, just to keep it at ease, but we need your support. So either spread the word about the National Zakat Foundation, especially this project, because it's never been done before. And if you would like to volunteer, or if you'd like to find out more about the National Zakat Foundation, please approach me. I've got a registration sheet here, so you can put your name down, and I can send you um, the details. And uh, just to reiterate, the fundraising dinner for uh, this project will be on the 24th of February. So please buy your tickets through the BCBN uh, website. And we look forward to seeing you there, inshallah. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask. When the time is right. Thank you very much, all, all three. So that was quite a good um, comparing view there of both the problems and some of the um, solutions. I mean, what, what I guess it, it means in terms of, in addition to the, the accommodation, which is absolutely critical, but also this kind of developing a buddy network, just to kind of almost kind of more people like you know, that, that, what the type is done in terms of, you know, more kind of practical, you know, how to fill out forms and you know, they used to drive a license or have to kind of apply for whatever kind of services they need and so on. And just having that kind of giving them good company, you know, even if the families don't provide that, at least kind of alternative company. And it's actually tragic that you know, we're kind of in this kind of situation. The one thing I didn't quite pick up though is going into why is it that there's, there's more Muslims in this situation? Is there anything particular there? What is it? Why is that the percentage more in the Muslim community? It's a really difficult um, question because there's so many different factors that uh, that influence this. Um, I mean, what I would say is that the people that, in our, that are in our prisons currently, they all come from, they, they all have a similar kind of a background in so much as, you know, I'm not saying that everyone comes from a, from a <coughs> troubled background, but there's certain things which are missing within their particular backgrounds which, which uh, 
contribute to their committing crime. But there's an added layer for Muslims, which includes um, uh, stigmatization from the community, um, you know, for, for crime. There's an added layer for people who have to lead, lead two different types of lives. So, in other words, they're Muhammad at home, you know, and when they leave the door, they become Mo, and it becomes a different type of, uh, you know, criteria to fulfill with, the, with your peer network compared to what you're going to be doing at home. Um, there's also this issue of um, parents uh, not necessarily having a great understanding of what's going on in the communities. Um, we've done many uh, networking sessions and, and workshops with communities, and that's from the sort of um, Eastern European communities, the Albanian communities, and other Muslim communities, Somali communities, and so forth, where we've had to explain to the parents, you know, these are the issues that your kids are going through. Do you know what your kids get up to? Shall we show you the YouTube video of your young, young uh, Adam, who you say is such a lovely guy? But here's a YouTube video of him telling, telling other people in his, uh, outside of his postcode how he's going to shoot them next week. Or do you know that they're smoking drugs? Do you know what drugs are? We've had to do workshops with people where we've set up rooms and we've put drug paraphernalia there and we've asked people who are, who are parents to come in and recognise what drugs are there. And you know, the funny thing is, like Tarek mentioned, no, there's nothing here, brother. What about the, uh, the, the foil there? I must be chewing gum. What about this pipe here? Oh, that must be, you know, shisha. Uh, what about this, uh, uh, this syringe here? Oh, maybe, maybe he's diabetic. These are the kind of things you hear from people. They don't want to face the fact that their children are involved in X, Y, and Z. And then there's the masjids and the communities. Not, not all masjids, obviously. But some masjids and the communities out there do not know how to engage with Muslim youth. They don't know what's going on in their communities. When we did a lot of talks to engage the, um, the, the masjids, we had some imams that come to us, and we read a particular imam who came to us from a very, very terrible neighborhood where there's lots of issues going on. And I said to him, a lot of issues in your community. He said, yes, that's right. Um, two Afghani boys beat, them to, uh, beat each other up yesterday outside my masjid. I said, are you, are you sleeping? You've had shootings outside your masjid. You've got people who are uh, selling drugs outside your masjid. You've got people who are storing guns inside your masjid. But you're worried about Afghani people beating each other up. You, you don't even know what's going on in your community. Now, how is that imam going to communicate with a young crowd or even the general population? What, what, what understanding is he going to have? Was he going to give fatwas and, and khutbas about what's going on back home? or what, what we did 20 years ago, or 50 years ago? Or is he going to really talk to the Muslim community about issues that they're currently facing? Is he going to be able to answer questions? I mean, when I was sitting in a class once, one brother, he said to me, I want to ask you something about sex. I said, okay, and someone else said, stuff for all how can you ask him on about sex? Our community, this is a significant problem in our community. Can any of our youngsters go to the imam and say, can you tell me about sex? What will the imam say? Nine times out of ten, that guy won't go to that masjid again. Then there's other issues that we've got in our community where people aren't developed enough to deliver a solution. So, for example, a lot of my guys that come to my prison, of course the families have told them, where's your son? Studying in Dubai. CEO of such a company in Spain. You know, because they don't want to face this, this issue. They would rather that than, than be stigmatised in their community. A young man that left my prison, he went out and he came back a soon while after and I said to him, how was it? He said, it was terrible. I said, what happened? He said, I went out to Juma, I sat in the masjid, while the imam was giving the khutbah, he noticed me. He said, oh brother, please, uh, stand up please. And when I stood up, he said, uh, the young brother has just come out of prison, if anyone can give him a job, that would be very valuable. Now, alhamdulillah, the intention was good, uh, but actually his family had told him that he was studying in Dubai. So now he's, him and his family cannot go into that masjid or into that community. Now, it's all very good. Number one, we have to face the issue. Number two, we have to have a good intention about the issue. Number three, we have to actually develop an understanding of how to help. Number four, once we've done that, we need to be in a position to help. So, for example, you go to a mosque and they say, we'd like to do some work with youngsters. Okay, what would you like? What, what capabilities have we got? We've got a table tennis table. Is that it? That's your capability. So you have to now develop this capability. Then you go forward and you have to resource that capability. You know, again, yeah, we've got 10 guys who are going to do this. Okay, where are they going to do? Who's going to pay for them? No volunteers, brother. Really? When you actually get them there, how many people turn up? One. Next week? None. There's a step appropriate.
approach here which we need to take. There's many issues in our community. I mean, there's a lot of work that we need to do to develop some of these issues. So that's kind of some of the answer I'll give, inshallah. There's, uh, there's others, I'm sure, will come from the other, other fellows. So. Um, Professor Sherman Jackson, uh, in a recent book, he said that the greatest threat to religion is apathy. And that's what's happened in the Muslim communities, so the fact that the, the masjids have been built but they're not providing a real service where people can actually connect to, to the religion or connect to these institutions that are supposed to be serving to the community. I remember when I was 10, when I was growing up in Shepherd's Bush, now Shepherd's Bush is uh, quite a nice area to live in now, but it wasn't a nice area when I was growing up. It was really rough. And even at the age of 10, I knew that you know, this is going to be a difficult run. Like, it's going to be very difficult, difficult to get through this. So even if my parents decided, you know, let's let's go to Bangladesh for about three years. You know, there's a British private school there. You know, I can afford to kind of pay you uh, pay the fees there. So we went to Bangladesh for three years. I come back. Three of my best friends, three of my best friends, and they were very able students, very able students. One of them goes into prison for GBH. One goes into prison um, for drug uh, for you know, selling drugs, dealing drugs, and one of them just got shot because he was, the, uh, he was selling drugs and the next rival uh, drug dealer wanted to get rid of him. Uh, and so a lot of these individuals and, uh, you know, would go to the mosque and have a service you know, catering to, the, to their needs. And you know, we don't even have a youth clubs as, uh, as common these days. So there's a lot of issues to be dealt with and you know, we need to kind of, um, uh, kind of really kind of look at the root causes of these issues. <laughs>